Turn with me in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Hallelujah. I'm going to preach and release a message to you this morning on the power of the anointing. It is the anointing that makes the difference. How many believe that today? A couple of you do. Hopefully the rest of you will wake up and get set free. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it is the anointing that makes the difference. Stand with me for the reading of the word, if you will. I'll read just a few verses of scripture. Now some of the modern preaching classes, they tell you... Don't use too much scripture in your text. Mm. Well, I'm glad I'm not a modern preacher and I didn't go to the modern classes. Amen. Because I think we need a little more word. Amen. And a less psychology. Amen. That's right. Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. The Bible tells us, I still believe the B-I-B-L-E is the book for me. me. Amen. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. In verse 17, Paul said, that Christ had sent him not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now there's a whole lot of talk today in the world in which we live of you have to use wisdom, they say. Well, now you know you need to use wisdom when the coronavirus is regarded. I do use wisdom. It's called faith. Amen. Amen. There's nothing right. more wise than to trust God. That's, That's right. right. Amen. Stop masking your unbelief with the world's wisdom. Yes, yeah, right. Ooh. Amen. Ooh, yes, good. <laughs> I'll find nowhere in the Bible that it says that it's through the wisdom of men's words. I could care less what mayor or what governor has anything else to say. That's right. Amen. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach. Not with wisdom of words, else the cross be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Which means the world doesn't understand the power of preaching. Amen. Now I've heard people say, you can't win people with all that preaching. Well, that's not what my Bible tells me. Amen. That's right. Amen. That God has still ordained the preaching of the gospel to win the lost. That's right. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise and where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Please God, please God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews or the religious require a sign. And the Greek, the philosophers, the modern humanists seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, which means the religious folk don't understand it. Right. Not to the Greeks. In Paul's days, those that are wise and have placed their stock in the philosophies of men, unto those people, preaching is foolishness. Chapter number two. Verse number four. And my speeching and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. 
that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated. Father, we thank you for your anointing this morning. Holy Spirit, I ask this morning that you would put me on and wear me, God, like you wore Gideon. Wear me like you wore Elijah. Wear me like you wore Paul. Father, put me on and use me. Fill me with your spirit till I'm overflowing. God, have your way in this place, and I thank you that your word will not return void. It will accomplish what you have sent to do. That's right. The Son of the living God has complete dominion in this house this morning. We'll ever praise your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. It is the anointing of God that makes the difference. Never before have we lived in an era and in a time in our nation, much less around the world, where we are in dire need of a divine reset of priority, an adjustment of the priorities and agenda of men. Paul said that he was not sent to do anything else other than to preach the gospel. Amen. That he was to do it not with the wisdom of men. Paul standing there in this time was in the era of Greek philosophy. The wisdom of men had swept around the world. It was a learned time in the earth. It was a system and a season where he himself was around all of the modern philosophers the modern theological thought and the philosophical thought of that day. Amen. Preaching to the Greeks, they had put stock in Aristotle and in Plato. Paul standing there telling them that the greatest wisdom of men was of non effect, but that it was the anointing of God that made the difference. Amen. Right. I still believe today that what we need in this world is the power of God what we need in this world is not philosophy it's about time that the house of God get the psychology books out of the pulpit get humanism out of their theological universities and get the power of the gospel the power of God that my Bible still says is the foolishness of God to the wisdom of men but God has ordained that the preaching of the cross would be the methods and the means that he would save over. Yes. The world would tell you that we need to be relevant. <laughs> Today we need to be relevant. And so they think that relevance has everything to do with the way you look and the mode in which you dress and the way that you dress up your services. Relevance has nothing to do with the outside garment. Relevance has everything to do with the message and your ability to have an answer to the question of the day. If you don't have an answer to the question of the day, I don't care what you look like. I don't care if you wear $400 jeans. I don't care if you have a $1,000 pair of Nikes. You're not relevant if you don't have the anointing of God. Amen. That's right. Tell me you're relevant if you don't cast out devils. That's right. Hey. Don't tell me you're relevant if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't tell me you're relevant if you think the power of God can be hidden to the, to the Tuesday men's group meeting away from everybody else. Don't tell me you're relevant if you want to treat the power of God as if it's something that you need to be ashamed. That's right. Because today, in the world in which we live, it is the anointing that makes all the difference. Yeah. You really want to be irrelevant? Get anointed. That's right. It's the anointing that makes you relevant. That's right. Paul here was reminding the church in Corinth that regardless of the allure of the day, to place their stock in the wisdom of men. To remember that it was truly, really the power of God that carried the answer. Paul said that his speech, or his preaching, was 
not with the enticing words of men's wisdom, but it came under the anointing and the demonstration of the Spirit of God. There is something significant about the anointing of God. The anointing of God, your Bible says in Isaiah 10 and 27, it shall come to pass that the oak shall be destroyed. The burden shall be removed because of the anointing. The anointing has a purpose. The anointing of God. The rubbing of oil. The smearing of oil. Signifying the presence of the Holy Spirit. The life of an individual. That anointing, your Bible said, would destroy yokes and it would remove burdens. But let me remind you that the anointing has a purpose. God doesn't send the anointing to give you a feel-good service. He doesn't send the anointing to make everything look good. He doesn't send the anointing just so that you can look nice. He doesn't send the anointing just so that it can sound good, so that your hair can stand up on your arms. He doesn't send the anointing so you can roll around on the floor. The purpose of the anointing of God is to destroy the power of the devil. It's to destroy yokes and to remove burdens. Yes. His anointing comes. That's right. That's right. Exodus tells us that the anointing of God was placed upon the house of Aaron so that they could be consecrated and separated. So that they could be marked. And the Bible says so that they could minister unto the Lord. The first thing that the anointing of God comes for is to separate you for service. That's right. Amen. The true purpose of the anointing is to sanctify or to set you apart for the service of God. You can't minister to them until you've been unto Him. That's right. The anointing was first placed upon Aaron's house so that they could minister unto God. The anointing comes for the purpose of separating you unto God. And then the purpose of the anointing is to destroy yokes and to remove burdens. That's right. Amen. We seem to have lost track of this thing. Luke 4, 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me. To do what? He hath anointed me to preach the gospel. He didn't anoint you to look good. He didn't anoint you to be cute. He didn't anoint you to fit in with the ecumenical boys club. He didn't anoint you to get the key to the city. He anointed you to preach the gospel to the poor. To set at liberty them that are bruised. To preach deliverance to the captives. That's right. Yeah, that's right. A whole lot of talk today. People have gotten caught up in entrepreneurialism. Outside of apostolic preaching of the gospel. God has called you. And anointed you. To preach the gospel. To set at liberty them that are bruised. To, to preach deliverance to the captives. To announce the acceptable year of the Lord. That's the year of Jubilee, the year every captive is set free. That's the purpose of the anointing. So the anointing has the purpose of service for separating you for Him. So that you can go to them. You can't get an anointing for Luke 4.18. Until you've had a, an anointing of Exodus 28.41. Where you have been set apart for service unto him. Because until you've been anointed for him. You'll never be anointed for them. That's right. My, my, my. There is something supernatural that happens. And the anointing comes upon you. That's right. The baptism in the Holy Spirit will do more for you 
than the phone booth did for Clark Kent. It will change you into an entirely different individual. There is something supernatural that happens when the Spirit of God has come upon you. Will transform you. In Psalms 23 in the fifth verse, the Bible says, you know, the 23rd Psalm, we all know the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We can quote that psalm. What you've got to understand is that David wrote that psalm from the perspective of a shepherd. Not a western shepherd, but an eastern shepherd. And in, in the Near East, the shepherds there will actually take their sheep. Understand this, that David writing many of his psalms always wrote them from the perspective of a shepherd and his sheep. That's why Jesus himself, John's gospel said, I am the chief shepherd. Jesus said, I am the door. No man comes in except he come by me. But if you don't understand the Eastern act activity of the shepherd, you'll never understand what he actually meant. Yes, Jesus meant he's the only way to God. He's the only way to heaven. There is no other way whereby we must be saved. But what Jesus was really saying is I am the door. Nobody gets through me. The east the shepherd would lay down the entrance way into the flock. They often didn't have gates. So the shepherd became the gate. He would lay in the opening himself on the ground. Would often take his rest, take his naps. Laying there, making his body the physical door, the entrance way into the field. The only thing that separated the sheep from the wolves was the shepherd laying at the door. And as long as the shepherd was there with his rod, it was impossible for the wolves to get by. That's why Jesus said, I am the door. I lay myself down at the gate. No man climbs over me. If you're going to get into the door, you've got to go by me. Jesus wrote that from the perspective. He said that from the perspective of the shepherd. David, writing the 23rd Psalm, wrote that psalm from the perspective of a shepherd. That's why he gets down and says, You have anointed my head with oil. They'll take the sheep. In the east and they'll rub them, their head with oil. They'll pour oil all around. The head of the sheep. Because there's a parasite that transfers from one sheep to the next where they'll knock heads and rub heads. And the parasite will get in, actually, and the bugs will get into the sheep and begin to infect the brain and get into the ears and then through the eyes of that sheep and, and cause it great agitation and misery to that animal. And so the shepherd will take oil and pour oil over the head of that sheep. And the oil begins to, to preserve it and to form a protective layer. And that oil becomes, that anointing becomes a protective layer between the sheep and the parasites. Let me tell you that not only is the anointing oil of God a mark for service and an anointing to set the captive free, but the anointing of God on your life will serve as a protective layer that will keep out the parasites of the devil. It will keep out the attacks and the assignment and the assailment of the devil against your life. His head, your head has been anointed with oil. It serves that protective layer. That's right. He said, you've anointed my head with oil. The oil of God that forms that protective layer. So the anointing is a protectant. It will seal you. Oil is a preservation method. Oil can make an old piece of dried up leather new again. 
We play ball all the time. When I was a kid, now kids just play on the television. We used to go out and get the new, you ever get a new ball glove? I'm talking about the real leather ones. You know? yeah. They gotta actually be formed and fashioned. You just can't grab one off the shelf and go out and try to play with it. Yeah. It's gotta be formed. There's a couple, there are a few ways you can do it. Some will put, tie them up, put them in the oven, but you gotta watch out doing that because you'll set your kitchen on fire. <laughs> Some people will put a ball in the middle and they'll tie a band around it, something. Form it just how they want it, have a car run over it, park a car on top of it. There's a whole lot of different ways to, to form that leather. The way you preserve that leather is by rubbing oil on it. Oil serves as a preservation method, but it also will reinvigorate old, dry, and brittle, frailed out leather. The anointing has the ability, no matter how old and how used you may feel, no matter how brittle you may seem, the anointing of God has the ability to preserve you and to bring. It doesn't matter how far along ago you think you've missed your calling. That's it right. doesn't matter how old that you seem to be today. God is not through with you. He has the ability to right. rejuvenate you. That's right. Amen. Yes. Oil serves as a protective preservation method. When I was in high school, we did some boxing. One of the things we do after we wrap our hands and before we do all that, we sometimes oil ourselves up. You've got to watch how much oil you use. Sometimes you try to sneak a little extra in there because. <laughs> reason that they'll oil themselves up is because oil will cause the blows to slide off. They don't hit you just square. It'll cause the blows to slide off you. It alleviates a lot of the force. The fastest way of escape is just to put a little oil on it. Oftentimes the predicaments you get yourself in are the predicaments that the devil sends against your life. The end, you can't even figure out how you made it out of that thing alive. You can't even figure out how you're still around today. How come that car accident didn't take you out? How come that, that affliction in the hospital room didn't kill you? How come the blows that seem to keep coming and never stop coming, they didn't seem to let up or light up? How come you're still around today? The reason you're still around today is because the oil of God on your life You didn't even feel like God was still there, but there was still something on you that caused the blows of your adversary to depart from your life. Amen. That's right. Oil. The oil of God. Just get one more. We have a divine reset that has to happen in the body of Christ. A priority readjustment. Never before have we lived in an age and in an era when the world has had more, more questions. And the church has ever had so few answers. Mm. We can go so fast, but we seemingly never travel any distance. We say so much, but never say anything. That's right. We can go to the moon, but we never seem to achieve anything. Our nation gripped in chaos and turmoil. A spirit of lawlessness has been loosed upon the earth. And the world and much of the church is paralyzed in panic, frozen in fear. That's right. There has been a sifting. The body of Christ, the wheat has been separated from the tear. 
We have been placed in a means and in a mode and in a season in which God himself has allowed the heart to get hotter and the cold to get colder. The number one threat against the church of God is not radical Islam. I've got news for you. The number one threat against the church is not some perverted governor in your state capital in Topeka. The number one threat against this nation is not a Democrat or a Republican. The number one threat against this nation is a backslid Christian. That's right. It's the very reason that people can line themselves up and support godless candidates. That's right. Mm -hmm. Sat with my friend in an Islamic nation. He said to me, do you know the number one threat against my, the church in my nation? I said, well, you know, maybe it's ISIS. And they had some activity in that area. He said, no, sir. The number one threat against the church in my nation is nominal Christianity. Nominal Christianity is your greatest threat. Mm. It is that version of Christianity that makes you comfortable. It's that version of Christianity that causes you to never want to rock the boat. It's that version of Christianity that makes you think somehow, someway, you've always got to be somebody's buddy. Somehow, someway, you've always got to be on a friendship basis with the world. That's right. Nominal Christianity is a deception. That's right. You're better off in the world than you are deceived. Yep. You're better off in the world than you are in a nominal church. If you're watching me on Facebook, if you go to a dead cold church, you need to turn and walk out of that place and never come back. Amen. That's right. First off, it's not your job to change the atmosphere. God works through authority. He works from the head down. And if the head is dead, find a different place. That's right. Nominal Christianity is a threat to your very existence. Jesus himself said, if you were lukewarm, I would spew you out of my mouth. That's right. You didn't say, well, I just kind of coax you. He said, we'll just do better next time. <laughs> he said, I would rather you be hot or cold. For if you're lukewarm, I will spew you out, vomit you out of my mouth. That's right. It's distasteful. Yes. Why? Because Christ nominal Christianity is moderate. Mm. You know, we live in a world and it's political now. We have liberal and conservative, and then we have those moderates. <laughs> I'd rather have a liberal or a conservative. You want to know what a moderate is? Backslid. Yeah. Moderate is somebody that plays the fence. They don't even know what side they want to be on. That's right. Moderate. Who wants moderate? Who wants a moderate blessing? <laughs> Who wants a moderate healing? Right. Who wants a moderate deliverance? What is moderate but a lie of the devil? That's right. Amen. I'm not a moderate preacher. <laughs> Paul said that they would have a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. Then he says, from such turn away, or in other words, run as fast as you can and never come back. That explains 80% of the church. Mm -hmm. You want to know what has happened in the world today? The world we have allowed people like Governor Newsom, people like him around this nation to determine what he thinks is essential and not essential. Well, of course, the devil wouldn't think the church of God was essential. That's right. You 
live in an era and in a place where Walmart can be open, and abortion clinics can be open, and the strip club can be open, and the ABC store can be open, but some demon-possessed politician tells you that you can't assemble in a house of God? I want to inform you today that they are not going to determine what is essential. But unfortunately, many people have said that the church is not essential and Walmart is essential. Backslid generation is biting it, laying down. That's right. Well, we must obey Romans 13. <laughs> All authority is given of God. Therefore, let every person be subject to the powers that Yeah? You know the man that wrote that laid his head on an executioner's block? And was executed for preaching things contrary to the very powers that be. Amen. It's not at all what he was speaking about. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just getting warmed up. I have to pace myself sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> 
happened to Samson. It happened to Elisha. It happened to Peter and Paul. It happened to an English plumber named Smith. A man of no education. It happened to an uneducated, illiterate, backwoods man from Kentucky named William Brennan. To a 17 year old boy dying of tuberculosis in his house named Dr. Lester Summerall. And once it had happened to him, a boy on his deathbed, the Spirit of God came upon him. He became one of the greatest missionary statesmen of his generation. Amen. God plus you makes the majority. Little as much when accompanied by the power of God. And no matter how broke you seem, no matter how sick you may be, no matter how far down you seem to be held, when the Spirit of God comes upon you. I hear the prophet Samuel crying out. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. Thou shalt prophesy and be turned into another man. When the Spirit of God comes upon you, He will transform every year. That is why the world hates the preaching of the gospel. Mm. That's why they have tried to infuse this thing with the wisdom of men. Because you can't explain the anointing of God. The postmodern world hates the preaching. Why? Because biblical preaching is anointed. Because the anointing is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit shows up, he's got three jobs. The Holy Spirit shows up to reprove of sin, to reprove of righteousness, and to reprove of judgment. I know it's not but it seems to be modernistic enough for you. I know it doesn't seem to be redemptive enough for you, but the Spirit of God still can fix us. That's right. You say, well, you ain't got to tell people all the time mm -hmm. that they're in sin. They already know it. No, they don't. They don't already know. We got children growing up not even knowing what bathroom to use. Mm, that's but the right. society's telling them they were born that way. That's right. You weren't born that way. You were well, you were born that way. You were born with a demon, maybe so. But you weren't born in a boy's body thinking you were a woman. That's right. No, you got a devil. The world hates the preaching of the gospel under the anointing of the Holy Spirit because it carries the power to convict of sin. That's right. Man, that's right. That's why they hate it. That's why they get agitated. That's why they get uncomfortable. That's why they want to stone you. That's why they want to beat you. That's why they don't like it. They say, tell me something nice. And they want to hear those life coach preachers. But God still wants somebody anointing with the Holy Ghost. That's right. Man. Bible says in Ephesians 4, 11, and God gave some to be apostles, prophets, and evangelists, pastors, and teachers. It does not say life coaches. That's right. <laughs> Want to be a life coach? Go join Craig Cardo or Tony Robbins. But if you want to be anointed of God and you're called to the five-fold ministry office, you need to get an anointing and find an altar somewhere. Right. That's why the world hates it. That's why they tell you you're not relevant. Why? Because they want you to shut up. Those demons are crying now. What have we do with thee, Jesus? That son of the most high. Because the anointing of God is diametrically opposed to the wisdom of men. That's right. Amen.
And they say, well, you can't preach like that. You can't be like that and still win a young general. Oh, yeah? Well, how come when I was in Kentucky, half the entire senior class of that high school came out to be delivered from drugs and alcohol? And I preached in a three-piece suit. I didn't have Air Force Ones on. I didn't have blue jeans on. I stood in a Kentucky cornfield and preached in a suit. And high school people came out. You want to know why? Because they don't care what you're wearing. They just care that you have the answer to what it is that they have. That's right. Man. You're bound by suicidal thoughts and depression. All they care is somebody can set them free. That's right. Man. Nothing more ridiculous than a 55 year old man in skinny jeans and his hat turned on backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you wear some grown men clothes? <laughs> feminine spirit needs to be broken out of That's that. right. Amen. Men looking like women. I passed a man on the airport on the way here. The women going by him look more like men than he did. I said to my wife, since when did Capri's come in style for me? <laughs> Dark shoes. That's right. Man. That's right. What are you going to do? You're going to wear gloves? You're going to come in contact with Corona? Hey, what am I going to do? How about what's Corona going to do when the virus touches my hands? That's right. That's right. Jesus said, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And that still means power over that devil of Corona That's right. The election infection. Oh. Shut down the church. 
church. That's why they're going to let you right. riot and right. protest and tear everything up. But you can't have a prayer meeting. That's right. That's right. Amen. Because the anointing has the power to destroy the plan of the devil. That's, That's right. That's right. They don't work that plan. They started working in generations ago. Mm -hmm. You turn on your TV. Things that are on your TV now would have never made it on television. That's right. 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, even 20 years ago. Yeah? This is how they started it. Mm -hmm. Remember in the 80s when those sitcoms would come out? And they put that homosexual in there? And they'd make him the funny man. They just started about one of them. They'd make him the funny guy so you'd watch it. Instead of praying, instead of turning that garbage off, you'd watch it because it don't seem that bad after all. He's just the funny guy. You know, he's the one that's the girl's best friend. You know, bite that program. The devil's laughing at you. Why? Still leave it alone for 10 years or 15 years. Make up the funny guy. Then what do they do next? They introduce what they want you to be programmed with. That's What's right. next? He gets married to another man. That's right. And then they put that in the programming for a few years. You start watching it for a while, it seems normal. Then the next thing you know, Sodom and Gomorrah on the left coast, around this nation, is trying to legalize. Well, they say, well, you know, I thank God I'm preaching in a Methodist church tonight. <laughs> One of them that still believes in the power of God and half the other Methodist church are putting homosexuals in the pulpit. There's still a remnant of God that has not bowed the knee to be. That's right. Man. You all used to preaching like this? <laughs> sure. Well, you better get used to it. Not bowed the knee to be. That's right. Amen. Mm. That's how they creep it in. That's how they, they slap that stuff in on generation to generation. They ease it in. Why? Because they're looking for the nominal believer. The nominal believer won't say nothing. The nominal believer won't rise up against nothing. Mm -hmm. The nominal believer just roll over. Well, I ain't you know, hurt me. It don't bother me none. Hey. The next thing you know, the floodwaters are at your door. And you turn around wanting to know how we got in this mess. We got in this mess because you're backslidden. Mm -hmm. We got in this mess because you don't pray no more. We got in this mess because you don't read the word no more. We got in this mess because you don't believe God no more. It's because great. you put more faith in the words of a politician than you do in the Prince of Peace. That's right. The spirit of Antichrist is the anti anointing spirit. What we're seeing now is a byproduct of what happens when a large segment of the church is void of the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. Boldness is a byproduct of the anointing. You can't ever find nobody in your Bible that was anointed and timid. That's right. Show me one. Boldness is a byproduct. When the Spirit of God comes upon you, yeah. half the world is coward in fear. It is a byproduct of the result of a situation that is devoid of the Spirit of God. That's right. Yeah. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived they were humbled and ignorant men. They marveled that they had. Acts 4.13. Boldness is a byproduct of the Spirit of God. I'm convinced that chat, the, the book of Acts is still God's great blueprint for the church of Jesus Christ. You all be able to flip into the pages of that book. They call it the Acts of the Apostles. For a reason why? Because they acted. Mm. Because they did something. That's right. It is the blueprint. Church of the Lord Jesus. 
You look in that blueprint, what you see there does not match up to your life. Something is out of skew with the diagram of the intended master framer himself. Mm. So let me walk you through Acts real quick. If you don't mind, I'll preach through every chapter right now. <clears throat> Acts chapter number one, Jesus said, you would receive power under the Spirit of the Lord has come upon you under the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You would have power to be a witness. Amen. He said witness, that's the Greek word martyrs. That means you would have the power to have boldness enough to invade your life. Thank you, Jesus. For the gospel. When I left Pakistan four or five days after I left, armed Islamic militants packed the house I stayed in. We're looking for my host. Why? Because they had enough boldness to walk out in the street in the middle of the corona pandemic, stand in the Muslim corner of a nation bound under the clutches of a demon god and Sharia law, and declare that Jesus Christ had the answer to Pakistan. Amen. Mm -hmm. Came to that nation and I asked my friend, the bishop of all those churches, I said, what's the number one thing your pastors need? He said, they need boldness. He said, many of them are afraid to go into the Muslim corner preach in the Christian neighborhoods. You understand something? If they catch you in Pakistan saying that Jesus is Lord over Muhammad, they'll kill you. Blaspheme Muhammad or the Quran, it's an ex it's a punishable by death. They can kill you without even taking you to court and ain't nothing gonna happen to the person that kills you. Mm. I wonder if that was the law here, how many people would be afraid. Preach them. You'd find out real quick who was saved in America. That's right. You'd find out real quick. Because right now you got people, well the, well, the governor says we can't even come, we can't have more. Oh, you, you think you'd make it there? Mm -hmm. The governor says, I got news for the governor. Repent and be ye converted? Yes. That's right. So, message. For you. So they went out there and they preached. He started the devil up. He came after. He made it out. But my point is this. He's anointed you to have the power to be bold and to have the power if necessary to be he didn't anoint you to cower in fear. That's right. Amen. He didn't anoint you to worry what the mayor has to say about it. He didn't anoint you to worry what the nomination national headquarters has to say about it. He anointed you with power. That's right. All devils and the cure diseases. That's right. Acts chapter 1, you have the power to be a martyr. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit fell. And thousands were saved with Peter like a drunken man stumbled outside. Acts chapter 3, they wandered into the cripple laid by the gate. Peter and John said, such as I have, give I thee. Acts chapter 4, persecution. Peter and John were arrested. They stood with boldness to face the commandment not to preach in that name. They said, we had perceived these men, though look ignorant and unlearned, they'd been with Jesus. Because something was different about them. So Acts 1, the Holy Spirit would give you power. Acts 2, it actually fell and thousands were saved. Acts 3, miracles broke out. Acts 4, came persecution. Acts 5, Peter's shadow healed the sick. Acts 6 and 7, Stephen had the boldness to be stoned to death. Acts chapter 8, Philip, he goes to Samaria. Demons cried out with a loud voice. When's the last time demons manifested when you showed them? Mm. Acts chapter 9, the chief persecutor of the church of God gives his life to the Lord. Acts chapter 10, the gospel comes to the Gentiles and an entire Roman's house is saved and they speak with new tongues. Acts chapter 11, they send out Paul and Barnabas as the first missionary. Acts chapter 12, Herod kills James, but the church goes 
was all. Mm. Acts chapter 12, the angel of the Lord shows up, breaks in their own jail. They weren't afraid to go to jail. Want to know why half the world is shutting down still? Now, I'm not talking about when this whole thing came out. People didn't know what was going on. But they're still shut down. Some of them still aren't open up. You want to know why? Because you've built a life for yourself that is greater than the life that is to come. Mm -hmm. And you are afraid to put anything on the line. That's right. You're afraid of loss. You're afraid of arrest. You're afraid of fine. God gave it to me. The world can't take it. That's right. If the world takes it, God will give it back. Amen. Thank God. Peter, James, and John were an American latte sipping Christian. <laughs> <laughs> they were beaten. The flesh was stripped off their backs. They were thrown in a prison, changed in, chained in sewer, manure running at the knee deep in that prison. And your Bible says in the very next chapter of Acts that Paul was smoked by the angel of the Lord. That's right. The governor of New York ought to be very afraid. That's right. Yeah. He ought to be very afraid to take the glory from God. Mm. Because let me inform you, Jesus is coming again and he's not coming as some baby in a manger. He's That's not right. some long haired flip flop wearing hippie hanging out down at the beach. He is the king of glory. Lord, mighty, strong, and mellow. God said, I saw the Lord. That's right. The white horse and he that sat upon it was faithful and true. In righteousness does he judge and make war. Makes war. Mm. He had a name on his thigh that no man knew save he himself. Upon him was a vesture that was dipped in blood. Behind him were the armies of heaven that followed him. And out of his mouth proceeded a two-edged sword. Not that he could pet the nations, but that with it he would smite the nations. Amen. He is coming back as the judge of the living and the dead. Not redemptive enough. I don't care what they say. I just care what this is. That's right. That's right. Who is they? Yeah. We're only halfway through Acts. Acts chapter 13. Witchcraft tries to stop the gospel. I'd like to believe that. <laughs> Witchcraft tries to stop the gospel. And the sorcerer that opposed the man of God was smoked with blindness. I can take you to Mexico, where my chief intercessor lives, that was once a witch, and when she left her coven, they sent five of them to come get her. And guess what happened to all five of them? Every one of them fell dead on her doorstep. Amen. Because when you oppose God, you will never win that outcome. Amen. Bible did. He posed Paul in Acts chapter 13 and he 
was smoked with blindness. They tried to oppose us in Haiti. They did. They did. That witch doctor. And the next year I was there, I came back, and his house was caught. That's and right. the people of God were living inside his house because God drove that witch doctor off that mountain and gave them the problem. That's right. He did. God will make the devil pay your bill. Mm -hmm. That's right. Acts 14 and Lystra. Crippled man is healed. He had the faith to be healed. Now I tell you, we've already gone through 14 chapters. How come they found you? nowhere yet? They were hiding in fear. Mm. Huh? That's right. This was an era when they weren't allowed to even gather in many places. So Nero was bowing them in the lion's den, burning them on the street corner like torches. That's where you get the word Roman candle from at firework time. That's where that word came from, a Roman candle. It's because they took Christians and they stuck them to a pole and poured tar over them and set them on fire. And they were called Roman candles. It's never found anywhere Paul instructed them. You all better stop having these gatherings. One of the most misused scriptures is Philippians chapter 4. I can do all things through Christ Jesus. Yeah, we got backslidden, demonized NFL athletes, Hollywood stars, standing up, quote, that verse, I can do all things to God who strengthens me. Now they're fornicating between game and time. Mm. As if that has anything to do with you scoring a touchdown. Read the chapter. Right before he said, I can do all things through God, through Christ who gives me strength. What did he say? I've endured shipwrecks. I've endured peril and persecution. Nevertheless, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What he was saying was the power of the anointing and the anointed one on the inside of him gives him the power to endure persecution. Gives him the power to endure shame. Gives him the power to endure beatings. Gives him the power to lay his hand on an executioner's block. It gives him the power regardless of what he faces to do. That's right. You know why people don't know what it means? Because you don't read your Bible. That's right. You don't read your Bible. Half, most of the church, the only time they open their Bible, well, actually they don't even open them anymore. They got them on their phones now sometimes. And sometimes they don't do that because they just hope they put it on the screen. And the only time you even see the Word of God is if it gets put on the screen. Mm. And what happens is that then faith comes by hearing that's right. Hearing by the word of God. Mm -hmm. How shall they hear? With how do you? Yep. Faith comes by hearing. If you find yourself outside of faith, I have to ask you what you're hearing. Mm -hmm. Because faith is not the only thing that comes by hearing. That's right. Fear and doubt also come by hearing. That's right. Faith comes by hearing. But then he defines. Because Paul understood a lot of things came by hearing. He said faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. You have to determine what you'll hear. That's right. Sometimes when you're believing in God for something, you've got to cut a certain segment of people out of your life. Mm -hmm. That don't have faith. That's a right. certain segment that always want to look at what they say. Well, you got to look at this when you listen to I am looking at it realistically. I'm looking at it realistically by his stripes. That's right. I am healed. Yeah. I'm looking at it realistically. And I don't know where my bills are going to get paid from, but he shall supply all my needs. I'm looking at it realistically. When the doctor can't figure out where the tumor's going to go, I'm looking at it realistically. That's right. Because he's he that from the stars into the sky, said to the seas, come this far and come no far. Because he's the creator and he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He is the Lord, the King of glory. He is Alpha and Omega. He is the Lord strong and mighty. He is God and beside him there is none other. That's right, amen. Heaven and earth.
words shall pass away, but my words shall endure forever. That's right. I would warn any nation. They were trying to burn this book in Seattle just a few weeks ago. I shared it on my Facebook page and all kinds of demons started manifest. I probably hit my block button more times that day than any time I can remember. Mm. I shared a video of a bunch of demon-possessed lawlessness with the spirit of the Antichrist, burning Bibles in the middle of the streets. They would see that one of those places. Burning the word of God. Yeah. Popes tried to burn it. Dictators have tried to burn it. Mm. Presidents have tried to burn it. Parties have tried to burn it. Adolf Hitler tried to burn it. But let me remind you that every nation, every kingdom that has ever rose in opposition to this book, it has lived and endured to preach the funeral for every man, for every woman, and for every machine that has ever rose up in opposition to it. Jesus said, My word shall endure for it. That's right. The church grew so much, now they had to have a council to discuss it. Paul was sent back out. Acts 17, the devil's cast out of a young girl. And that one act of deliverance caused Paul and Silas to be thrown in jail because they were deemed as those that had troubled the city. They were troublers of the city. Many churches have that reputation. Amen. Of troublers of city government. Well, they get in the Bible. Acts 17. Now these that have turned the world upside down have come now to Thessalonica. Acts chapter 18. Paul goes out on his third missionary journey. Acts chapter 19. The Holy Ghost hits Ephesus, the most demonized city in the entire world in Paul's day. And the Bible says in mighty crew the word and prevail. Acts 20, they try to kill Paul. Acts 21, Paul gets arrested. Acts 22 through 26, Paul gets sent to Rome to answer the charges. And he preaches to the rulers along the way. And Amen. even a grip of the king almost becomes Christian. Amen. Acts 27 and 28. Paul is shipwrecked in Malta and a revival breaks out. Acts starts in revival and it ends in revival. Mm. The church was birthed in power and it should continue in power. How many of you believe that tonight? Amen. Today? How many of you believe that where you are today? This power, this same anointing, it is available to you. Amen. That's Amen. right. The oil of God in your life makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. Stand with me. It is my mission to see the people of God do with power for God has oil for you this morning. Amen. He has an anointing for you this morning. He has a fresh touch, a fresh rubbing of the Spirit of God for you this morning. That's right. He has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, of a disciplined and sound mind. Amen. Amen. That's what He's given you. The anointing of God will destroy yokes and remove burdens. That's what he'll do for you this morning. That's, right. Amen. That's why the enemy hates the assembling of the believers. That's right. Why? Jesus said, when two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. That's, That's right. right. There is something supernaturally that happens. 
and the corporate body of believers come to I thank God for online. I thank God for all of the media stuff and television and all that kind of stuff. But there is nothing that beats being in the tangible room. That's right. right. That's right. Where the glory of God shows up. That's right. That's why the Bible still says, Paul, well, for those that believe he wrote Hebrews, you should not cease to assemble yourselves or not forsake the assembly of yourselves together. That's right. And then he says, even so much more as that day approaches. Mm. What's he mean by that? As it seems to get worse every day. He's, the writer is writing that understanding that there was a death warrant out for believers mm -hmm. in the Roman world. Many of them were afraid to assemble for risk of death. Not of a virus, mm. but of the lions in the Roman Colosseum. He said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, regardless of what you see. Because there's something supernatural that happens when faith is multiplied by the fellowship of believers. That's right. Amen. Amen. Come on, lift up your hands this morning. Believe that the Lord is here to today. Amen. Every situation where you're at, every need that you have, the power of God is available to you right now. Mm. Whatever it is that you need. If you're in this place this morning, you say, I need God. If you're in this place this morning and you say, I need more of Him in my life. Mm. I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to come to this altar. I want you to come to this altar because there's a fresh Come to this altar, ma'am. There's something for you. Come to this altar. Come to you right now. Come to this altar. There's something for you. Come. Come on and come. There's fresh oil. There's fresh oil for you. There's fresh oil for you. There's fresh oil for you. He'll destroy yokes. He'll remove burdens. He'll set the captive free, whatever it is. Whatever it is you need from God, it's available to you at this altar right now. It's available to you at this altar right now. You may be away from God. You may be lost without Him. Today, you can accept Jesus. You can get right with God. You can accept Him as your Lord and Savior. Today, He can fill you with the Holy Ghost. Today, the yokes can be destroyed. The burdens can be removed off of your life today. The power of God is available to you today. Come on, there's room for everybody up here. Come on. Come on. Some of you may have even found yourself buying into some of the programming. Mm. That's okay. Today there's an infusion of faith available to you. Today there's power available to you. Today the anointing is available to you. There's a special anointing that's available to those that are hungry. The Bible says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst. It does not say, blessed are those that starve. That's right. A lot of folks are starving. Not everybody's hungry enough. That's that person that will refuse to sit down, that person that will refuse to accept status quo. Hungry. It's available to them. Amen. And I believe that what we're seeing in the earth today, right now, everywhere that I've gone the last several months, the people of God have been hungrier than ever before. Why? Because in many places they haven't been able to assemble, or in many places they, they, they're, they're tired of being shut out of God. They're desperate for God. That's right. So I will drive two hours to be delivered to hormone treatment withdrawals. Because mm. they're hungry. And that's what's happening right now. You're hungry. Jesus never said no to a hungry person. Amen. This morning, whatever it is that you're hungry for, in God, it's available to you. Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands. Father, right now, pour out your spirit. Yes. Pour out your spirit in this place. Pour out your spirit in this place this morning. By the power of God right now, I take authority over injury. I take authority over sickness. 
I take authority over affliction. I serve notice on every demonic spirit resting the minds of the people. In the name of Jesus Christ, loose them and come out of them. Yes. Body. Thank you, Jesus. God, fill them with the Holy Ghost. Yes, Lord. May there be a fresh and fill yes. Cry out and say, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Lord, Jesus. Lord, Jesus. Lord fill me fresh. Fill me fresh. Do it, Lord.